Top Gun from the top. Um, so, hello everyone, my name is Andy McGovern. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite companies, Netflix, and the Netflix stack and legacy modernization at Netflix. So a little background on Netflix. They were founded in 1997 in Scotts Valley, California by Reed Hastings and Mark Randolph. They were established as a DVD rental by a mail service. And just by show of hands, does anybody here still use the uh, DVD in the mail service? No, nobody? I'm, I'm the only one? Uh, well, yeah, as of 2007 and moving forward, they've definitely made the focus of their business uh, the Netflix streaming app. Um, and in 2013, they moved into producing original content with their first original series, House of Cards. So Netflix today, they serve 69 million users. They are active in over 60 countries, uh, streaming 100 million hours of content a day with, uh, as of 2015, 42 billion hours watched. This is the Netflix interface circa 2013 back whenever their application was, uh, they were running on something called the Monolith, which is one large centralized legacy application written in Java on the server side uh, using JavaScript on the front end. Uh, so in other words, they had to write everything twice. Any, any problems they had, they had to you know, make two solutions. Uh, it was such a large application that it required a 40 minute startup. So basically any time a developer wanted to work on anything, uh, that's how long it took for the program to compile. Um, it had to handle various disparate tasks, including business logic, rendering forms, user experience, and it ultimately proved to be too much logic and too many back-end microservices for one application. It also limited, limited them quite a bit as far as you know, what kind of developers they could hire because they required all of their developers to be uh, proficient in Java. Uh, and also, it, since their developers had to handle so many different parts of the application, it was sort of a situation where they were, had to be good at a lot of things, but were great at uh, no one thing. So it was sort of like uh, the Netflix Aziz Ansari show, uh, jack of all trades, master of none. So this ultimately led them to try and simplify and decompose their app. Uh, some of the things they wanted in doing this was a, they wanted a dumb rendering layer whose primary concern was routing. They wanted to move to more of a single page application paradigm. And they wanted the ability to simplify the stack via using one language. Um, and that ultimately led them to embrace Node.js. So the Netflix stack today, uh, this is not entirely comprehensive, but it consists of Node.js, Restify, React, Falcor, and something called RxJS. So I'm just going to kind of go through the, and just talk a little bit about how they're implementing each one of these tools. So Node.js basically allowed the development team to use container layers for their edge services. It allowed them to manage and compartmentalize various aspects of their app much more efficiently. It allowed their, their more UI-focused teams to just kind of focus on the user experience and write data access applications in JavaScript that could communicate with that unified remote service application. And it increased the flexibility for different implementations of the Netflix app. So in other words, you know, if they you know, Netflix on Apple TV didn't exactly have to be the exact same as Netflix on the iPhone, on the Xbox, etc. And here's just a visual representation of that. Uh, you know, basically the Apple TV Netflix gets its own uh, Node.js app. The iPhone Netflix gets its own Node.js app. JS app. The Xbox and so forth, and yet they can all still communicate with this unified remote service layer, which is uh, still to this day written in Java. So what problems did they have uh, using Node.js? Uh, one of them actually involved uh, the Express framework that we all know and love. They were able to detect this problem via something called a flame graph. So what is a flame graph? It basically uh, represents problems with different parts of the stack, uh, such as memory leak, CPU usage, uh, of different functions in the stack of a particular program. This, they had a flame gra their flame graph showed that large amounts of CPU usage and request latencies were occurring along their express route request handlers. And here is a um, just visual, uh, horizontal visual representation of basically identifying those express routes as, th as the culprit in these uh, CPU issues they were having. Um, so this ultimately led them to build a framework called Restify, which is a uh, back-end framework that's modeled fairly closely after Express.js. It was built by Yunong Zhao, a senior engineer at Netflix. But it offered better performance, maintainability, and visibility. It offered the Netflix team more control over HTTP interactions. It comes with automatic support for the dtrace framework. 
and it offered them better insights into the amount of memory, CPU time, and network resources being used by individual programs. In other words, just a lot more transparency than uh, they were able to get with Express. For their, as their main database technology, they use something called Falcor, which uh, is um, you know, different from SQLize in that it's not the relational table uh, based uh, database paradigm. It uses nested objects. It uh, represents remote data sources as a single domain model via a virtual JSON graph, and it automatically traverses references in your graph and handles all network communications. And this is just a visualization of some of the various um, databases that you know you would use that they use with the Netflix app, uh, Netflix app recommendations, titles, ratings, and basically showing how they all are just stored in this one single model. This one. Uh, nest, nested JSON object. And any, any, um, if you ever want to get something from the database, it would always be like model.get, and then from there you would add in the more specific information about what you were looking for. Um, they use React at Netflix now. Um, I, uh, it's, it's, they've definitely reconfigured it to be more of that single page. There's the nav bar at the top that is always there, and as you navigate around the website, uh, it's, it's, you know, it doesn't re-render the entire DOM. Uh, so it has, they were able to get all the, the benefits of uh, React that we all know and love, such as better startup speed, runtime performance modularity, but where they really had a big win with React was in reconfiguring their rendering pipeline. So they switched from the Java-based HTML renderer to a JavaScript one that can be run on both the server and the client. The legacy Java tier was rendering parts uh, before it would even start up on the client side, it would basically have to render everything that this particular user might do while on the site. Uh, so it ended up rendering a lot of stuff that, uh, you know, parts of the page that they would never visit. So React allows them to render the initial markup and React components from the server, but then subsequent changes can be rendered entirely on the client side. This ultimately reduced uh, client side startup times by 70%. Uh, and this is just sort of, yeah. A Another visual representation of kind of the old model versus the new. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is some of the interesting stuff that Netflix has done with async and handling async. So what async stuff do we do? So user interactions, AJAX, timers, animations, web sockets. And as we all know, our favorite way of kind of dealing with the problem of async and uh, avoiding callback hell is with promises. And as we all know, promises return a single value and cannot be canceled. They have a guaranteed future. Uh, so Netflix encountered a problem with this. Basically, uh, they would, you know, if if a user was to, you know, like this example here, want, want to watch Narcos and they click on Narcos, the promise that uh, comes from that that database interaction um, will basically cannot be canceled. So th if they were to pick Narcos and then Netflix goes and fetches everything for Narcos and then immediately hit the back button and say you know what, I'm tired of Narcos, I'm tired of uh, no more Pablo Escobar, I want to watch Daredevil instead. And they, so they click back and they hit Daredevil. But that, uh, that, that promise from that database interaction for Narcos is still out there. So this was leading to all kinds of weird issues and uh, state-related bugs, which ultimately, ultimately led them to uh, use a library called RxJS. It is a library for composing asynchronous event and event-based programs, it uses something called observables. And observables are somewhat similar to promises in that they are, you know, or at least they're trying to solve the same problem of async and, um, uh, you know, avoiding callback hell. But unlike promises, they don't just return one value. They can return a stream of zero, one, or many values. And they can be used over any span of time. And most importantly, at Netflix, they're cancelable. Um, they are currently being standardized for ECMAScript, so uh, fingers crossed they may be native in a future version of JavaScript, and we all uh, may be getting to know them. <laughs> and uh, they're so cool that uh, Ben Lesh of Netflix calls R uh, RxJS the lodash uh, for async. So that about r does it. Um, I hope this was educational as far as just getting a brief glimpse into the life of a Netflix developer. And uh, I thank you all for coming, and thanks for listening.